13 years ago, Julie and I stopped going to church. And we didn't go back for four years. Here's what happened. We moved from Longmont to Southern California. And I was working an internet job. And we started shopping around for churches. And um, we'd go and we'd be like, all right, that's, that's all right. And we tried to get plugged in and see what they're doing. And, and learn that everything they were doing was just inside the four walls. It was a church that was just focused in on itself. And it was all about trying to see... Uh, how good of a show they could put on Sunday. And I and Julie and I both would get a little bit discouraged or disgusted, and, and we'd move on and try to find another church. And so within a year, we went to 12 churches. And what happened was, uh, as we continued to go, the more and more I didn't want to go. We'd attend, and I'd turn to Julie afterwards, and I'd say, I'm good for another month. You know, it's just, I don't want to go again. And it got to the point where we just we stopped. And uh, didn't, didn't miss it. And I don't know if you guys uh, have ever felt that way, that church isn't relevant, that it's, it, it's just always focused in on itself. This isn't uh, a 21st century United States problem. This problem existed back in the time of Christ. In fact, uh, Jesus' uh, half-brother, James, wrote a whole book about this. And so the book of James is about putting your faith into action beyond the four walls. And today, we're going to look at just one verse in James. James chapter 1, verse 27. And it reads this way. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. See, James was confronting a people who were saying, what matters is all this, this one day and that we have good attendance and that we have the right celebrations. And James is saying, those things are fine, but they're not enough. There's more. And so he tries to give them a little shock and says, well, actually what God thinks is pure religion and is that you go out and you help widows and orphans. And so... That's why I was able to come back to church when I met this church. I knew about this church before, but when we moved back to Colorado, Rick said, hey, well, how about checking us out? And because this church cared about the community, because it wasn't striving to be just the best church in the community, but the best church for the community, I could say, I could, I could be a part of this church again and I could come back so I'm not saying quitting church was the right thing to do I'm just telling you my, our, our story and that it was a church that cared about community and about caring about widows and orphans that was able to bring us back we're in a series right now right in the middle of it uh, called let justice roll I love that line let and it sounds like some Todd Beamer would say you know and and you, it's come you might be you're familiar with from uh, Martin Luther King's speech let justice roll like a mighty river it's actually from the book of Amos and what we're doing is something that we don't normally do at this church. We're actually hitting the pause button, looking back and reflecting on what God has done through this local expression of his body. And uh, last week, uh, we focused in on what this church has done when it's come to emergency disaster relief. And uh, we looked at our work in the Windsor tornado and the Joplin tornado, and then really uh, camped out on the flood last year, and what we did during that disaster, and to the point that the uh, mayor of Lyons could say, Life Bridge has been a bridge of life to the town of Lyons. And so today, though, we're going to focus on what God has done through this church for orphan care. You know, and this is, this is God's heart. Uh, caring for orphans and for widows. He, he often in scripture, I mean there are dozens and dozens of scriptures where orphans and widows are put together. And the reason he does that, he takes this age spectrum and he says these are the most vulnerable, the least powerful people uh, uh, on the planet. And they're the people I care about the most. And you see, God, that's God's heart. You want to know what God's like. He cares about the people who the world might c consider to be the least important. 
And in fact, in Psalm 68, 5, uh, it's, it describes God this way. Father to the fatherless, defender of the widows is God. And it says, in his holy dwelling. And so I like how Ramin says it. When he's his holy dwelling, think of God's man cave. You know, and so God's in his man cave, and he doesn't have posters and uh, uh, fat heads up of John Elway or Peyton Manning. He's got portraits of widows and orphans up there, and that's who God is rooting for. Now, going back to James chapter 1, verse 27, I want to focus on just one word. It says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows. Caring. So let's just focus on this word Care And the reason I want to do that is because um, that's something that we can all do. Not all of us out here are called to adopt a child. Not all of us are called to foster. In fact, my guess would be at any given time, maybe 2% of the general population uh, is called to foster and adopt. I know it's way higher in this church. It's amazing to go down the kids area and see all the families that have adopted and fostered. And not all families are called to open their homes, but all are called to open their hearts. We're all called to care. And there are two practical expressions of caring that we can all do when it comes to this matter. The first one is simply say a prayer. Pray. Pray for these kids. And we can all do that. And that's where my journey started with orphan care was by praying. And this is how it happened. Um, my, uh, just, in fact, just yesterday, we sent off our youngest daughter to England. So uh, we're in a new stage of life, empty nesters. But when our girls were three and five years old, uh, we would pray with them at night. And we started a new prayer routine. We called our manners prayers. And so we'd say, okay, girls, we want you to say something to God. We want to say something that you're thankful for, something you're sorry for, and then ask God, please for something. By the way, this is a good prayer for grown-ups. So tonight, tell God, God, thank you, sorry, and please. And so this is how it would go in our house, though. So uh, Shelby was the youngest, she, uh, at three, and she, she threw me for a loop one night. <clears throat> uh, we were praying for these things, and, and she, did, she did this. She said, uh, and they always say the same thank you. God, thank you for mom and dad and nana and grandpa, you know, and always say all the people. But then Shelby, with her eyes closed, chubby little fingers, opened up her eyes and said, what God say? I was like, oh boy. Uh, he said, you're welcome. And uh, he loves giving you good things and he's happy that you've got good people in your life. All right. Close her eyes. And uh, they say they're sorries. Those were always the best because he found out what happened during the day. <coughs> so for example, God, sorry for putting the potpourri down the toilet. And you're like, oh, that's what happened to it. And so, but she opened her eyes and said, what God say? I was like, um, God says you're forgiven, but don't do that again. <laughs> All right. And then what they would always pray for was um, a dog on the please. God, please give us a dog. So this time, Shelby was like, here it comes. I better, better be ready. What God say? He said, ask your mom. <laughs> so, so Julie said, <laughs> God says he wants you to ask, please help the orphans. And they're like, okay. So that became the new prayer. No more asking for a dog. They said, please help the orphans. So that was every night, pray that. And then Julie and I saying, I think God is saying uh, yes, but I want to use you to do that. And that's another lesson in prayer. Um, God does intervene in our lives, but God prefers to collaborate with us. If you can be part of the answer to your prayer... He wants to do that because he's wanting to grow you. And so Julian uh, said, okay, uh, let's help orphans. Um, I guess there's some in Africa, right? So we started uh, sponsoring uh, a, a child in, in Kenya. And uh, by the way, uh, a lot of people here sponsor kids. It is a great thing. And uh, 
we have o- over, I know, over 100 people sponsor over 100 kids in this il- island off of Ecuador that was inhabited by a slave ship crashing into it. It's desperately poor. I went down there with a few of you a month ago. And I just want to show you in a picture the difference in a year uh, makes. This is a picture of Jack Hay. With, this is the girl uh, he sponsors. And then a year later, with her going to school, getting fed regularly, I mean, just see the difference in her smile. Um, it, Jack's before picture, he doesn't get any better. It's, he looks the same. Uh, <coughs> so sponsorship is a great thing. And then we felt like, we need to do more. So we sponsored a second kid. And then we thought, we need to do more. I mean, you know, this took over a period of time. And we're like, okay, we can't afford sponsoring more kids, so we need a, a new plan. And Julie asked, are there orphans in the United States? Well, I've never heard of one. So we started doing some research and learned that you don't call them orphans in, in the United States. They're called legally free. They're kids in Colorado, not Colorado, just the United States, foster care system who are legally free. And so let me explain this a little bit to you. In Colorado, for example, there are four to 5,000 kids in Colorado who are in foster care. And their goal is to be reunited with their biological family. And it's a great goal. There is a small segment of those kids uh, today, it's about under 300 in Colorado, who, that's not their goal. What happened to them was so awful that the goal now is adoption. And so those are our orphans. And so we started learning about that. Julie wanted uh, to start becoming a foster parent. And I said, I don't think God is telling me that. <laughs> and so, and then, so then she learned uh, about a thrift store that was just a few blocks away from us that uh, the, all the proceeds did were, uh, go to help support foster and adoptive parents. And she said, I think I want to uh, volunteer there. And I was like, sounds safe enough. So she volunteered there, and it only took a week. And she's like, oh, I saw this boy today. Uh, and I was like, oh, I made a big mistake there. And uh, so through her prompting and God's prompting, uh, I fortunately said, yeah, let's, let's look into being foster parents. We got our um, first boy. He, had, he lived his first six months in a house, drug house. Uh, when the police found him, they didn't even know where his mom was. She had lost seven. This, he was number seven. His name was Keegan. When we got him, he was sickly. He was afraid of people. He was afraid to play. Uh, by the time um, we, um, the time we had him, um, we fell in love with him. And I, that's where I learned you can love someone. You love a child as deeply as you love your own biological child. And I used to call him my boy. And we wanted to adopt him. And uh, fortunately, his grandparents stepped up and said, we're going to raise him. So it broke our hearts. But it was a right thing to do. And that's where we learned that God was saying, for our lives at least, uh, at this this time in our lives, God was wanting us to foster kids with the goal of reunification. And we did that for five years with eight boys. And it all started with a prayer. I mean, I had no idea God would do that with us just saying, uh, I mean, we should have just gotten a dog. I, is <laughs> <laughs> God help orphans. Uh, and so my challenge to you is to pray. Go out and see one of those kids' pictures and pick one and pray for them. And say, God, please help so-and-so. And God's going to do all sorts of different things. I mean, he's not going to call everybody to do what we did. There will be a thousand different stories. Uh, for you, uh, it might be um, uh, volunteering with Adopt Crowd Kids or volunteering with Boulder County. Uh, it might be helping an adoptive family. It might be mentoring a child. It's all just pray And listen to the Spirit and obey. The second thing was that you guys can do beyond praying is help 
others be aware. You're learning about this. You've known about it, many of you, for years now. Help others become more aware that these kids exist. These kids, to the majority of people in Colorado, are invisible. They don't know they exist just like we didn't know. And so this is how it happened for us, though, and, and for this church. Um, I think it was seven years ago, I got a phone call from uh, Boulder County Child Welfare, and they were reaching out to us and said, can, can we meet with you about uh, possibly seeing if we can work together? And I said, sure, be happy to. So next week, this lady comes in named Cindy, and picture uh, kind of something like Mother Teresa, okay? So she comes into my office and, and uh, uh, sits down, and uh, she says, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you. She said, I've been trying to get into a church for three years, and you're the first to say yes. It's like, what? And then um, she shared a little bit about herself. Uh, she said, well, I, I had been a nun, and I was like, I knew it. Uh, <laughs> I've been a nun for 20 years in the Cabrini Green housing projects. And then, and then she floored me. I didn't see this coming. She, and, and then uh, she met a priest. They became Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, oh, I like her. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and she shared. She, what well, she told me, she said, in, at that time, I think she said, in the 26 years of child welfare in Boulder County, there had never been a day where there hadn't been children waiting to be placed into a safe home uh, for foster care or into a forever family. And then she said, I have a challenge for you. Can you help us change who waits? Can you help us have so many grown-ups and so many families? It's the grown-ups who wait, not the kids. You women, <laughs> my wife and Cindy... I was like, what was I going to say? <laughs> I was like, yes, we'll help you. And so about a year and a half later, it was, I think, this, if I get, uh, I, I wish I kept the letter. I, I think it was around Christmas 2008, um, you get a letter from Boulder County, and it's a thank you letter. And they're sending out, and they're saying thanks in, in part to our, our efforts, Boulder County had increased recruitment uh, of foster and adoptive families by 96%. And for the first time, they had more families than kids. And so, <clears throat> now what happened? One of the key things that happened was, uh, this, there's a, you saw that gallery coming in. Uh, the state had just call, started this gallery called the, uh, the Heart Gallery. And at that time, there were about 800 kids in foster care, I mean, in, who were legally free. And they had this gallery and had about 30 pictures on it. And we hosted it, and we were the first church to host it. Before then, it had been in public venues like the State Capitol Building, places like that. And you guys just embraced it. And so many of you signed up to uh, learn more about foster care and adoption and to just to do your part and to help in any different ways that you could. And we began uh, volunteering with the state, just saying, how can we help you, knowing that there was more kids that needed to be photographed and this gallery needed to be in more places and and so, uh, volunteering a little bit, and we said, hey, this is really an underutilized tool. Uh, could you create a duplicate um, dedicated to churches? And we'll, we'll take it to churches. And they said, that can never happen. I was like, oh, okay. So we kept serving and helping, and a year later, I said, hey, I've got an idea. How about we create a duplicate gallery dedicated to churches? And they're like, Great, let's do it. <laughs> Power of relationships and serving in humility and, and, and following through on promises. And so they said, on the condition that you guys, you, you run this one. You, 
you deliver it, you find the places. We said, we'll do that. A year later, uh, we meet with them again and just said, how's it going? Are you okay? Are you happy with this? And he said, actually, um, we, could you guys kind of take it over. And they, uh, they said these words. They said a couple of things. He said, we, we don't want this gallery to be seen as the state's gallery. We want this to be the community's gallery. And we don't want these kids to be seen as the government's kids. These are our kids. Can you help us do that? And then they said, we want to be the first state in the country with virtually no kids waiting to be adopted. And I was like, here we go again. <laughs> okay, we'll help you do that. So we, we've taken that on. We, uh, added, we formed a, a nonprofit under the church and, then, and now I've had to um, separate for just uh, for shrewdness and um, it, we have a nonprofit called Adopt Colorado Kids. It was born out of our hearts and now we uh, a few years ago started uh, doing video all in, uh, taping all these kids and we're giving them a face and a voice uh, to these kids who were invisible. Now people can see that they, they're, they're real and they're beautiful. And so We've videotaped hundreds of kids, and I just want to show you a sample. This is a little two-minute montage, and this particular montage is of sibling groups, because a lot of siblings get separated, unfortunately, and we're trying to keep siblings together. And so uh, here's, here's a glimpse of what we do. someone in my heart nice to me um they care about me what would the people be like in your family um i would definitely have kyle and i know he would definitely have me huh mm -hmm. i would not want to be in a adoptive family without danny me either because he's the best I shouldn't have looked at that last part. Uh, aren't they sweet? We just did a, a photo and video shoot Friday, 17 more kids and, and sibling sets. Um, one little seven-year-old came up to one of our volunteers, and they were connecting, and she's a young mom, and in the middle of a, their conversation, he said, are you going to adopt me? I remember interviewing Sage, who had a, I think she was 11. She's still up for adoption at that time. She wouldn't look up at the camera. She was looking down the whole time answering questions. And then when we asked, what do people need to know about you? She finally looked up. She said that I'm lovable. If we don't do anything... 89% of these kids within a year will either end up, if they age out at 18, addicted, jailed, homeless, or in a crisis pregnancy. There are 3,000 churches in Colorado. 
There used to be 800 kids, now we're down to 300. This is solvable. Colorado is leading all 50 states in solving this problem. We have been invited by Virginia, which is 49th, Mississippi, which is 50th, to help them and other states as well. Right now, I just ask that as you leave, take look at some eyes of some of those kids, pray for them. Take, um, we've got different bookmarks you can put in your Bible and just whatever you're reading in your nightstand. And remember, pray for these kids. Boulder County is out there. They, we are great, grateful for them. They're great partners. I know people are shocked that a church in Boulder County work together. Cats and dogs can get along. You know, it's, uh, we love them. Uh, uh, grafted by love, our adoption support ministry. Parenting is hard. Uh, see, maybe, maybe if you don't feel called to this, but you feel like, I can help an adoptive family, I'll, I'm a, I'll adopt an adoptive family. I'll be there to help with laundry, tutoring, whatever it is. Uh, do that. Um, right now, let's, let's just close this message uh, by spending a, a minute praying for sp some specific kids. Would you guys do that with me? Father, I thank you. Thank you for your great love for all these kids. And right now, I pray for Ethan, who, had, when asked what he wanted, he, his requests were so simple. He just didn't want a PlayStation or vacations. He said, I just need somebody who will feed me and give me a bed, get me to school on time. Pray for Clemisha, who specifically asked to be adopted by a Christian family. I pray for DeAndre, who even though he's turned 18, he asked not to be taken off the heart gallery so he could still have a chance of being adopted. I pray for Tristan, who's 13, who has been waiting since he was three years old to be adopted. Father, please help the orphans. Amen.